Good morning. The Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee will please come to order. Uh, today we are holding a hearing on our nation's growing mental health and substance use disorder crisis. I will have an opening statement, followed by Senator Murkowski. She's standing in for uh, Ranking Member Burr for this hearing. And then we will introduce our witnesses. I believe Ranking Member will join us a little later as well. After the witnesses give their testimony, senators will each have five minutes for a round of questions. While we were unable to have the hearing fully open to the public or media for in-person attendance, live video is available on our committee website at help.senate.gov. And if you are in need of accommodations, including closed captioning, you can reach out to the committee or the Office of Congressional Accessibility Services. We continue to see a high number of new COVID cases, so we are having this hearing in a larger hearing room where we can be socially distanced, limiting the number of people who are in the hearing room, accommodating both some of our committee members and our witnesses through video, as we have done previously, and taking additional measures such as wearing masks. As always, I appreciate the work from the staff uh, of the Sergeant at Arms, the architect of the Capitol, and our committee clerk and staff to make this hearing as safe as possible. Thank you to all of you. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, our nation was facing mental health and substance use disorder challenges on multiple fronts. Millions of people experienced depression, anxiety, and other mental health disorders. Drug overdoses were on the rise, and our health workforce was stretched far too thin. In 2018, mental health issues were responsible for 56 million doctor office visits and 5 million emergency room visits. In 2019, suicide was the second leading cause of death among adolescents. From 1999 to 2019, the rate of overdose deaths more than tripled. And then COVID-19 hit and made things worse. Our nation lost over 100,000 people to drug overdoses in a single year. And overdose deaths, especially deaths involving fentanyl, skyrocketed in my home state during this pandemic. Nationwide, we're also seeing a concerning rise in methamphetamine and cocaine use as well. Across the country, people are stressed, and this pandemic has been especially traumatic for children. Our schools, teachers, and education leaders are seeing this every day. Our educators are on the front lines trying to help so many students experiencing mental health challenges, often without the support of trained mental health professionals. We've seen sharp increases in kids' visits to the emergency room for mental health crises, thoughts of suicide, and suicide attempts, especially among girls. And as of last December, over 167,000 children have had their world shattered after losing a parent or caregiver to COVID-19. Some have even lost both parents. And we know marginalized students are facing the worst of these challenges, deepening inequities they already face. We also know educators and caregivers are facing their own mental health challenges from the strain of this pandemic as well. We need to continue helping our students and educators and ensuring schools have the support, training, and resources they need. But right now, our mental health and substance use disorder workforce is stretched too thin to meet the needs of our kids, let alone our communities at large. And if we just keep stretching without taking action, something is going to break. For example, nearly half of psychologists reported feeling burnt out last year. And we aren't even close to providing mental health care to everyone who needs it. Almost 130 million Americans live in areas with less than one mental health care provider per thousand people. In my home state of Washington, our mental health care workforce is only able to meet 17% of our state's needs. Meanwhile, nationwide, less than one in 10 people who need treatment for substance use disorder actually get it. And these hardships are not felt equally. The highest increase in opioid deaths recently has been among black Americans. Rates of suicide are highest among American Indian and Alaska Native populations. And people with developmental disabilities who are already almost five times more likely to have mental health needs have had their lives appended. Of course, while some communities may face greater behavioral health challenges, this crisis affects all of us. Even if we aren't pers personally struggling with mental health or substance use, we all have friends and families who are, whether we realize it or not. 
We all rely on first responders, healthcare providers, teachers, and other frontline professionals who are facing burnout and trauma. We all have a stake in making sure people can get the help they need. That's why Democrats passed the American Rescue Plan to provide resources for schools to hire counselors and psychologists, community-based behavioral health providers, programs to treat mental health, suicide, burnout, and substance use, and more. But we are not done. Healing the scars of this pandemic won't be quick or easy. This will take years, and we must act accordingly. It's time to build on this committee's bipartisan history of expanding access to mental health services and responding to rising drug overdose deaths like we did in 2016 and 2018. In my state, I have seen how communities can benefit from some of the critical programs this committee has worked on, including programs at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. For example, in Clark County, which saw fentanyl deaths triple in 2020, Lifeline Connections is using a SAMHSA grant to better prepare teachers and school personnel, law enforcement, first responders, and caregivers to respond to mental health crises and refer those in need to appropriate treatment. Meanwhile, in King County, federal support has allowed Neighborhood House to provide mental health services for over 150 adults experiencing homelessness. And the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation are using grant funding from SAMHSA to fight the high rate of suicide in their community by updating their health records and mental health procedures, hiring more therapists, and expanding telehealth services, which have been critical to reach people during this pandemic. If we are going to respond to the behavioral health issues this pandemic has made worse, it is clear we have to build on these efforts. That will take legislative action. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about how we can do that and working with Senator Burr and everyone on this committee on a bipartisan effort to reauthorize, improve, and expand critical federal programs that address mental health and substance use disorder challenges. I hope that every member of this committee and the Senate can work together to bring their priorities forward to us to include. My goal is to work with Ranking Member Burr to fold these priorities together into a larger package that makes progress on many of the issues that we are going to hear about today, like suicide screening and prevention, youth mental health, the opioids and overdose crisis, and breaking down barriers in access to mental health. Finally, I want to acknowledge, acknowledge that mental health and substance use do, disorders do not exist in a vacuum. In addition to this pandemic, there are a lot of issues people are worried about right now, from gun violence to climate change to systemic racism to, to just making ends meet. As we work to do more to help people struggling with depression, anxiety, and stress, we also need to look for ways to solve the problems that are making things so hard for so many people in the first place. And I hope to continue to work with my colleagues on these root causes as well. I'd also like to introduce two letters for the record, one from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association with recommendations for addressing the national emergency in child and adolescent mental health, and the other from members of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, highlighting the importance of supporting the behavioral health workforce. So ordered. And with that, I will turn it over to Senator Murkowski for her opening remarks. Madam Chairman, thank you for convening the hearing. I appreciate that. I also want to, to thank Senator Burr for asking me to substitute in as ranking member today on this incredibly, incredibly important and certainly timely conversation as we talk about mental health and substance abuse disorders. Madam Chairman, you have outlined um, well, I think, the this, this statistics, the challenges that we're seeing. Uh, we, we knew, we have known for, for years now that mental health and substance abuse disorders have, have really been at, at crisis levels in many parts uh, of the country, certainly in, in my state of Alaska, and we have seen those challenges and those issues only further compounded by this pandemic. Access across the country, access to mental health and substance use care remains severely limited, exacerbating suicide and substance abuse rates. You've mentioned the statistics in your state, Madam Chairman, uh, with regards to mental health providers and facilities. 
In Alaska, more than 80% of our communities do not have sufficient mental health providers. Uh, well, again, we are seeing this crisis only continue to elevate. And unfortunately, it knows no, no barrier on the spectrum. We are seeing more and more young kids. I mean, it used to be when we were talking about suicide statistics, we would look at that 25, 45 year uh, age bracket. And now the alarm that we're seeing is in 10, 11, 12 year olds who are, are, are suffering. And we have an obligation to hear and to respond. Alaska ranks second in the country for suicide deaths. We've seen a sharp increase in drug overdose, overdose deaths, just as we have seen across the country this year. Uh, Alaska has one of the highest rates of binge drinking. Suicide rates amongst members of our armed services have doubled. We have seen some very, very disturbing uh, trends of late. And uh, as we've seen across the nation, our Native people face shockingly disproportionate rates of mental and behavioral health and substance use disorders and suicide. And these are statistics that, that keep you up at night, not just because that they are numbers, but these are real people. These are our constituents. These are people in, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. They are people who are in pain. And as we will hear from the young woman uh, Claire Reinier, who will be introduced in just a moment, a youth advocate from Anchorage, Alaska, she, she urges us, she reminds us that these people that are not statistics, but these real people are looking to us, they're watching the leaders, waiting for us to do something. And I think the message of hope needs to be that we are paying attention, that we are listening, and that we are working together to try to address some of the root causes of what we've seen. I think just within this committee, we've seen some strong collaboration on efforts. Um, I've been working with Senator Hassan on the Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act, which allows healthcare providers to prescribe buprenorphine, um, which can truly, truly save uh, save lives with the medication-assisted treatment. In addition to life-saving substance use treatment, we know that we have to invest in, in wraparound recovery services. Um, I've visited programs in Alaska that focus not just on preventing the overdose deaths, but also really building a community for Alaskans in recovery, because that has to be the follow-on. We've, uh, we've worked on efforts to reduce fetal alcohol syndrome disorders to address the mental health needs. Um, Senator Smith and I are leading both the Mental Health Professional Workforce Shortage Loan Repayment Act to bolster our supply of providers, but also the Telemental Health Improvement Act to ensure that insurance covers these critical services. Senator King and Senator Kelly uh, and I are working on the Effective Suicide Screening and Assessment in the Emergency Department Act to provide resources for emergency room personnel to identify, assess, and treat individuals at risk of suicide. I think, unfortunately, we know that's where far too many um, who are seeking help end up sitting in, in an emergency room where you don't necessarily have those that are trained to identify and assess. Later this week, I'm going to be introducing the Guarding Our Mental Health Act to prevent Coast Guard members who seek help from their for their mental health from being automatically processed for discharge. Again, we know we've got to make headway on the stigma issues associated with, uh, with mental health. And uh, then with Senator Rosen, we're going to be introducing the Youth Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Act to ensure that uh, SAMHSA can provide additional mental health programming to elementary, middle, and high school students. So Madam Chairman, I think we, we know around, uh, around this Senate here, there's plenty that can divide us. Um, I would like to think that mental health, substance abuse, these are areas where we really can find true bipartisan consensus. And hopefully we can build a package that addresses these issues head on. And I, I commend the work that you have made along with Ranking Member Burr 
to do just that. Again, I'm looking forward to being able to introduce the committee to uh, a bright young Alaskan, Claire Rainier, uh, and when it is appropriate, I will do that. But thank you, Madam Chairman, and I look forward to the, to the testimony from all witnesses today. Thank you. Um, we will now introduce today's witnesses. Senator Burr has joined us, so I will turn it over to him to introduce our first witness, Dr. Princeton. Madam Chairman, thank you very much for uh, holding this hearing and for the opportunity to introduce uh, Mitch Princeton uh, to the committee. Um, Mitch is from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Dr. Priestin is the American Psychological Association's chief science officer and responsible for leading the association's science agenda. Dr. Priestin also serves as the John Van Setters Distinguished Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He began his academic career as an assistant professor and later director of clinical psychology at Yale University Department of Psychology. Dr. Pristine's research is focused on interpersonal relationships uh, primarily amongst adolescents, and he's published more than 150 scientific articles and nine books over the course of his career. Dr. Pristine uh, earned his doctoral and master's degree from the University of Miami, his bachelor's degree from Emory University, uh, Dr. Priestine, I thank you for being here today and for all your work on behalf of children and families across the nation and in our great state of North Carolina. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Senator Burr. Uh, next, we have Dr. Michelle Durham. Dr. Durham is the Vice Chair of Education in the Department of Psychiatry and a Clinical Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics at Boston University School of Medicine and Boston Medical Center. She's a board-certified physician with a background in pediatric psychiatry, adult psychiatry, and addiction medicine. Dr. Durham's public health and clinical roles have always been in marginalized community, and she's been a dedicated advocate for equitable mental health treatment. She's also the director of clinical training for Boston Medical Center's Transforming and Expanding Access to Mental Health in Urban Pediatrics, or the Team Up Initiative. Dr. Durham, so glad that um, you could join us today. I look forward to your testimony. Our next witness is Sarah Goldsby. She is the director of South Carolina Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services. She was confirmed to that position by the South Carolina Senate in February of 2018 after serving as acting director since August of 2016. Director Goldsby has led South Carolina's response to the opioid crisis and serves as co-chair of the state opioid emergency team, meaning she's been on the front lines of the crisis we are talking about today. In her role, she's helped expand access to naloxone across South Carolina. She also understands the importance of addressing social determinants of health and making sure people have access to care. Director Goldsby previously came before this committee last year to discuss mental health and substance use disorder challenges related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Director Goldsby, welcome back. I appreciate your joining us to share your expertise once again. Our next witness is Jennifer Lockman, PhD, is the CEO of the Research Institute at Centerstone in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Lockman oversees all research and program evaluation activities at Centerstone. Her work focuses on developing and testing new interventions to further suicide prevention care. She's been a lead evaluator for multiple substance abuse and mental health services administration grants focused on suicide prevention in youth and adults, as well as in zero suicide health programs. Dr. Lockman, thank you for joining us today. I look forward to hearing from you. And finally, I will turn it over to Senator Murkowski once again to introduce our last witness. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm delighted to be able to introduce to the committee Claire Rainier from Anchorage, Alaska. Claire is, is an articulate youth advocate. I think she has uh, been able to effectively give voice to so many through, through storytelling. Um, she has, in this capacity, encouraged others to speak out. I first came to, to uh, recognize Claire when her story was printed in, on the front page of the Anchorage Daily News um, uh, some months back, outlining what she had done as one individual who, who looked at... Uh, and what was happening around her as a young girl and the lack of availability of services, the questions that she had, and really nowhere to turn but literally the internet. 
uh, she had indicated in that article, she says, you know, mental health was just never talked about. It was not talked about in the home. It was not talked about at school, even in health classes where you would expect to hear it. The discussion was about making sure that you you ate the right foods, you got the right sleep, but we don't focus on mental health. And so her advocacy has been one that uh, is truly, truly impressive. She's a recent graduate of West High School. She's spending her gap year working with the National Alliance on Mental Illness there in Anchorage. She's going to be attending Middlebury College in Vermont this fall. So Claire, thank you not only for for being here today and sharing your story, but your advocacy and your voice on behalf of so many. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Senator Murkowski, Ms. Reinier. Thank you for joining us today to share your story. It's really important that we hear voices for, like yours about what students are facing, so we appreciate it. With that, we will begin our witness testimony. testimony. Dr. Princeton, you may begin with your opening statement. Sorry, can you hear? Yes, we can. Chairwoman Murray, Ranking Member Burr, Senator Murkowski, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Dr. Mitch Princeton, Chief Science Officer of the American Psychological Association. APA is the largest scientific and professional organization representing psychology in the US, with over 130,000 psychological researchers, educators, practitioners, and students. There's been much discussion of a mental health crisis in the US, Today, I want to talk briefly about what that crisis looks like. This is an issue that began well before the pandemic, with millions of Americans experiencing emotional and behavioral symptoms that we could have prevented. The US has fared more poorly than most, with the rate of suicide attempts in the United States higher than in any other wealthy nation on the planet. There is simply not enough mental health care providers. And there is not enough investment in science to use what we know to prevent mental illness. Today, only one of seven Americans with mental health or substance use disorders is receiving treatment scientifically proven to work. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has made this much worse. In 2021 alone, Children's Hospitals saw a 42% increase in self-injury and suicide cases. School principals report that their staff are overwhelmed with children experiencing apathy, hopelessness, anxiety, and thoughts of death. To say that this is a mental health crisis is not enough. This is an accumulation of decades of neglect, stigma, and unequal treatment of mental health compared to physical health. Now we are at a turning point like we have not seen since World War II, when our country elected to make a serious investment in mental health by building the VA system, investing in a mental health workforce, and forming the National Institute of Mental Health. That was over 70 years ago. The time has come again. Today we know that Bifurcating physical and mental health is based on antiquated notions. It's time to create a mental health system that reflects the 21st century, and we have no time to waste. Here's what you can do immediately to address this national emergency. First, we desperately need a diverse and robust mental health workforce. Today, we have 5,000 psychology trainees who could serve a far, far greater number of people if Medicare were reimbursed for their work during residency, just as currently occurs for medical residents. This just makes good sense. Doctoral interns in psychology have an average of over 700 hours of independent direct patient care experience, more than most medical residents, and we can mobilize thousands of mental health care workers quickly. Second, we have the psychological science to deploy preventive interventions through school and community-based partnerships. The Mental Health Services for Students Act and reimbursement for psychologists to guide these partnerships can have multiplier effects. So each member of our current workforce is building resilience within entire classrooms and schools. Third, we need to expand the integration of primary and behavioral health care because it works, but not with a one-size-fits-all approach. We'll need to support all evidence-based models and allow primary care providers the flexibility to determine which model best suits their patients' needs. Fourth, the 2022 Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act Enforcement Report, just submitted to Congress, indicates that our federal agencies are struggling. Congress must grant the Department of Labor the authority to assess civil monetary penalties for violations of the law or enforcement will be almost impossible. 
Now, this will only get us part of the way. We'll need long-term strategies as well to fix this problem that's been growing for decades. Our country invests $15 billion annually to ensure that we have enough physical health care providers with the appropriate specialties and spread throughout the country. Yet we invest less than 1% of that amount to build a mental health care workforce. Congress must authorize, reauthorize, and significantly expand the graduate psychology education and minority fellowship programs and enact the Mental Health Professionals Workforce Shortage Loan Repayment Act. It's also critical that we significantly expand our scientific investment in psychological science so we can better understand psychopathology, develop novel treatments, and build resilience before the next stressor occurs. A $1 billion increase to NIMH, NICHD, and NIMHD for youth mental health would still be a very small proportion of the allocation currently offered to study conditions that afflict far fewer youth than those currently suffering from psychological disorders. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. We stand ready to help you with any and all issues dealing with human behavior. We have the expertise to address your committee's work, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Dr. Durham? Thank you, Chair Mary, Ranking Member Burr, and Senator Murkowski, and distinguished members of the Senate Help Committee for holding this hearing and providing me with the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Dr. Michelle Durham. I'm a pediatric and adult psychiatrist at Boston Medical Center and board certified in addiction medicine. In my over 10 years at BMC, an academic medical center in New England's largest safety net hospital, I have never seen our mental health care services stretch so far beyond their capacity as they are now. Since late December 2021, we have had 30 plus patients in our psychiatric emergency department, more than four times its capacity, presenting with a much higher level of acuity, some waiting for evaluation and others boarding awaiting for placement in an inpatient psychiatric unit. The patients we serve at BMC are predominantly low income with approximately half of our patients covered by Medicaid or the Children's Health Insurance Program, the highest percentage of any acute care hospital in Massachusetts. 70% of our patients identify as Black or Latinx, approximately one in three speak a language other than English as their primary language, and over half live at or below the federal poverty level. BMC has a particular expertise in connecting marginalized communities to health and social services, and yet we still find it happens all too often that our patients with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders get stuck in a revolving door, falling in and out of mental health and substance use treatment systems, in many cases ending up on the streets, either episodically or chronically homeless, only to present repeatedly to our emergency department. One of the issues at play is that the necessary supports for these patients are not in place, including affordable, low-barrier housing and coordinated care integrated with a supportive community. The question is really, how do we get people with co-occurring mental health and substance use everything they need to survive and be healthy? BMC is in the very early stages of implementing a housing-first approach in partnership with the city of Boston to get people living on the streets just steps from our hospital campus, oftentimes living with co-occurring mental health and substance use issues, housed first and then provide wraparound medical services and social supports. Our hope is that this can work to break the vicious cycle for these folks, many of which are BMC patients, and eventually can serve as a model for other municipalities to replicate. Our system is also in the process of constructing an 82-bed psychiatric facility in nearby Brockton, Massachusetts, to address the shortage of inpatient psychiatric beds and increase our ability to treat the mental health and substance use needs of our patients from across the region. The facility is expected to provide 56 inpatient psychiatric beds with the capacity to treat patients with co-occurring disorders and 26 clinical stabilization service beds. We estimate that the project will involve a total of $27 million in sunken startup cost, a barrier that the federal government could help lower to incentivize capital investments to expand inpatient psychiatric capacity. As a black, Spanish-speaking psychiatrist waiver to prescribe buprenorphine for opioid use disorder, I'm all too aware of the patients our treatment systems are failing to reach. Preliminary reports from the CDC indicate that the U.S. has eclipsed 100,000 annual drug overdose deaths for the first time ever, while nationally overdose death rates have increased in every major demographic group in recent years. Black men have experienced the largest increases. Even in Massachusetts, where we've seen population-wide drug overdose death rates level, off in recent years, the death rates for black men stand out in stark contrast, having increased astounding 75% between 2019 and 2020. 
Communities of color are suffering disproportionately from COVID-19, and they are dying at disproportionate rates from substance use disorders, bearing the brunt of two compounding public health crises. At the same time, black men have comparably low rates of mental health and substance use treatment. At BMC, we've launched the Health Equity Accelerator to eliminate the race-based health equity gap by utilizing data-driven and community-based research to inform and change the way we approach care for black people and people of color. While we don't yet have all the answers we seek, we do know that a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work and that access is strained across the mental health and substance use continuum. That's why reauthorizing funding to support states and localities responding to mental health and the substance use crisis in flexible ways is crucial. Thank you to the Senate Health Committee for your commitment to coming together on a bipartisan basis to sustain funding in these critical programs over time. I'd like to end by providing a glimpse into the reality of what our patients face every day. In one of my recent shifts in our psychiatric emergency room, a man in his late 20s came in seeking help for his mental health and substance use. In our short time together, he described his onset of opiate use at nine years of age. His parents were both using substances. There was minimal supervision in the home. As we see often, the patient had experienced years of substance use, time in the carceral system, death of many family members, and unsuccessful relationships with limited supports. He has been in and out of treatment over the years as well, but our system as currently designed ultimately exacerbates issues and prevents recovery. In order to make progress, we must work to transform our mental health and substance use care system into one that recognizes relapse as a reality, coordinates care, destigmatizes and decriminalizes substance use, and ultimately one that sees the humanity and people with mental health and substance use issues as in, that, enable, that can enable them to recover and live healthy, fulfilling lives. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Goldsby. Good morning, Chair Murray, Ranking Member Burr, Senator Mikowski, and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Goldsby, and I serve as Director of South Carolina's Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services. I also serve as President of the National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors, or NASADAD, and it's a privilege to join you today. I'd like to begin by thanking you for your work to pass the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, or CARA, and the 21st Century Cures Act and the Support Act. In addition, thank you for providing historic federal investments in programs housed within the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, including the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment, or SAPT block grant. As you mentioned earlier, our country continues to experience the devastating impact of substance use disorders and the number of overdose deaths is simply staggering. In my home state of South Carolina, overdose deaths have increased by 60% over the last five years, and more of those deaths occurred in the last two years with the increased use during COVID-19 and the incredibly potent illicit fentanyl supply we've been inundated with. Overall, almost one third of individuals admitted to treatment in our country's publicly funded addiction system, <clears throat> excuse me, cited heroin, or prescription opioids as their primary substance of use. Yet we also know substance use disorders impact different states, counties, and communities in different ways. In South Carolina, for example, we're seeing a rise in admissions to treatment for alcohol use disorder, where 42% of people admitted to treatment reported alcohol as their primary problem. There's no doubt that the COVID-19 pandemic contributed to increases in problems related to substance use disorders, yet we've all worked to adjust. States and providers have developed innovative approaches to prevention, treatment, and recovery programming. Federal agencies and Congress have worked to provide important flexibilities through program guidance and communication. In addition, Congress and the administration worked to provide critical funding for prevention, treatment, and recovery, along with life-saving overdose reversal medication. As I observe the work moving forward in the field, I continue to be amazed and inspired by the incredible commitment courage and resolve that I see on a daily basis. I'm particularly grateful for our frontline providers. Even though they're exhausted, they're stretched thin, they continue to serve, they continue to help, and they continue to save lives. And they continue to help find a road for recovery for everyone they serve. And I offer a number of recommendations as we continue our work together. First, we asked that federal policy ensures a strong SAMHSA as the lead federal agency on substance use disorder service delivery. We believe SAMHSA should be the default agency for all federal substance use disorder programming. And we applaud Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use as a leader of SAMHSA. 
Second, please work to ensure that federal policy initiatives and federal funding for substance use disorders flows through state alcohol and drug agencies. Given our work to ensure quality and evidence-based services and to ensure effective planning, implementation, oversight, and accountability. Third, we hope for continued support of the SAPT block grant. The flexibility afforded in the block grant allows states to target resources where they're needed more based on data and the conditions on the ground. Our country faces a giant workforce problem. We're struggling to find people to do the job. And while we appreciate HRSA, we need an all hands on deck approach. We, can, we hope this committee will give SAMHSA and its programs full statutory authority to immediately help with our workforce challenges. We appreciate this committee's work to help reduce suicide and improve our nation's response to people experiencing crisis. Since this time, SAMHSA has been actively working with stakeholders to prepare for the July 2022 launch of 988. And as we move forward, we ask that Congress and others specifically elevate and specifically reference substance use disorders as a core focus of work related to crisis response. We believe this approach is needed given the many distinct and unique considerations that accompany service delivery for people with substance use disorders and substance driven crisis. Finally, we hope Congress continues to work with stakeholders and the administration to maintain certain flexibilities that were granted in connection with the public health emergency. I'm happy to review other recommendations with the committee as time permits. In the meantime, thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to questions you may have. Thank you. Dr. Lockman. Thank you. Thank you. You want to make sure your mic's on? Can you hear me now? No. Can we have a staff person? Or Senator Burr. <laughs> I think you have Is that it. okay? There you go. Thank uh, you thank so you. much. Okay. Thank you for the help this morning. I would like to thank Chair Murray and Ranking Member Burr and this committee for your dedication to seeking solutions to the growing mental health and substance use crisis our country is facing today. I'd also like to thank Senator Braun for his leadership for the state of Indiana, which is one of the states we are proud to serve in. I'm honored to be here as the voice of my colleagues at Centerstone and most importantly on behalf of the people we serve. Centerstone is the nation's largest nonprofit mental health company. Centerstone provides community-based behavioral health care, substance abuse treatment, and intellectual and developmental disability services. At Centerstone's Research Institute, a Centerstone company, we conduct research to prevent and cure mental illness and addiction. We also work to translate data into meaningful clinical tools and practices, thereby reducing the research to practice gap. We applaud this hearing today because unfortunately deaths due to suicide, overdose, and drug and alcohol related disease are all too prevalent. As of 2020, suicide was the 12th leading cause of death in the United States for adults and the third leading cause of death for youth. Between 40% and 50% of Americans have been exposed to suicide during their lifetime. This means that at least half of us sitting in this room today are likely to have been personally affected by the loss of someone that we loved to suicide. For this reason, Congress, in partnership with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, created the Garrett Lee Smith National Strategy for Suicide Prevention, Zero Suicide and COVID-19 Emergency Response Suicide Prevention Grants. Centerstone's healthcare system is honored to share our experience and the outcomes from some of our SAMHSA grants we have received. Through our Zero Suicide SAMHSA grant, we are now working to spread evidence-based practices known to decrease suicide throughout our entire health system and using data to make them even better. For example, we have updated our suicide prevention pathway to ensure everyone in our healthcare system gets evidence-based suicide screening, risk management, and treatment. We have moved toward a new screening system that first asks more about upstream risk factors for suicide, such as sort of belongingness, perceived burdensomeness, and acquired capability for suicide, and then also asks about suicide directly through the PHQ-9 and CSSRS. We anticipate the screening process helps us identify and treat drivers of suicide risk earlier and with better outcomes. We have also piloted a suicide prevention specialty care clinic, the first known in community mental health centers in the United States. We expect all of our Centerstone clinicians to be able to identify and treat suicide risk. However, it is difficult and costly to keep all of our clinicians up to date on suicide specific treatments as fast as the science changes. In medicine, we have seen that people often get better outcomes at cost when at high risk by seeing medical specialists like cardiologists and oncologists. Thus, through our grant, we are creating a referral system so that persons at the highest risk for suicide can also be seen by a specialist, someone who is trained in multiple suicide-specific treatments, the very best that science has to offer. 
Our grants have also provided a crisis follow-up program for youth and adults during care transitions from inpatient facilities, a high-risk period for suicide attempts and reattempts. Our data suggests this federal program helps individuals reestablish connectedness, decrease their sense of burdensomeness, reduce suicidal ideation, and successfully link to outpatient care 70 to 90% of the time. These services would be unbillable and impossible without the federal SAMHSA grants. Knowing this program works to save lives is especially timely given the July 2022 launch of 988 as the three-digit dialing code for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. As we look toward launching 988, we must also continue to evaluate strategies to ensure services are funded and available nationally. This is why we also support the Behavioral Health Crisis Services Expansion Act as a crucial component to financing a crisis care continuum. Another grant program that has been a lifeline is the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic, Medicaid Demonstration, and CCBHC SAMHSA grant program. CCBHCs allow consistent care for those with mental health or substance use conditions and a place to go in times of crisis. This model is helping to address some of the dire workforce challenges our field has faced even prior to the pandemic. We recommend continued investment in the CCBHC program. Centerstone is also pleased to be one of the only few comprehensive opioid recovery center grant recipients in the nation. We recommend continued investment in this promising program. Of all the things you might take away from my testimony today, please be sure to hear this. Federal funding works. Federal funding saves lives. Federal funding helps prevent suicide and substance-related deaths, uses program evaluation to help make evidence-based programs even better, and helps individuals recover and contribute in their communities. In the words of one of our clients, quote, there's no way to define a future if you are not there for it, and everyone is really focused on making sure that you stay there for it, stay alive, stay safe. It's been really helpful for me to develop my own path. It's made a lot of difference, end quote. It's been one of the great joys of my life to watch people go from a place of deep despair to go on to rediscover their talents, their strengths, and go on to build a life that they really want to live. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Rainier, we'll turn to you. Chairman Murray, Ranking Member Burr, Senator Murkowski, and members of the committee, thank you for having me here to testify today. My name is Claire Einier, and I'm from Eagle River, Alaska. In high school, I was a storyteller and facilitator for mental health advocacy through storytelling. This organization is a youth-led, youth-founded group of Anchorage students working to decrease stigma and increase access to mental health resources. <clears throat> Last year, I worked as a program and outreach coordinator for NAMI Anchorage, the Alaskan affiliate for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I'm here today to advocate for youth who have or currently are experiencing mental health conditions. I'm advocating for myself, for my peers, for Alaskan youth, but also for youth across the nation to give them a voice. To be completely clear, the people who most need the services are least able to be here advocating. I am representing the tip of the iceberg. A few years ago, I experienced a difficult and dark period of depression. But more than being difficult and dark, my experience was governed by confusion. I was self-harming and all I felt was uncertainty. I asked myself, do I need help? How should I know? I turned to Google, taking dozens of are you depressed quizzes. However, Google is not a doctor and is in no position to diagnose a middle school girl or anyone. It left me more confused. Each night I wondered what was wrong, and in hindsight, it is terrifying to know that I was physically harming myself and still unsure if I needed support. What I uncovered online and on social media was horrifying. The photos, videos, and stories were disturbing but it was even more disturbing to discover that I was attracted to it and found myself going back to it. No one bullied me or neglected me. From an external perspective, my life was perfect, but mental health was never discussed at school, at home, or even in my health classes beyond the take care of yourself, get sleep, eat well, and exercise spiel. <laughs> so I kept telling myself everything was okay. Why should I feel sad? Why should I feel lost? I'm so fortunate, how could I possibly feel this way? Ultimately, I didn't seek help because I didn't know if anything was wrong. And I'm more than an anecdote. When I tell a room full of people that I was confused or that I turned to Google for help, I see a chorus of nods. 
I need more than one hand to count the number of close friends who have experienced suicidal ideation. And barriers to care do not discriminate. They infiltrate every home, regardless of ethnicity, class, or geography. Compared to most, I'm privileged. Finding a community of peers let me know that I was not alone. I was once again able to be focused on school, sports, my family and friends. I learned how to maintain my wellness. And I'm proud to be able to say, I know where you're coming from and this pain can be temporary and to know that it is true. The people who did not find these supports, unlike me, are not here. Many of them will never be able to tell us their story. So we have an obligation to these youth to make a difference. We need to support school counselors, station social workers in schools, fund wellness programs at universities, and introduce mental health curriculum into health classes where they belong. We must reflect on the way we separate academic success from mental well being. We need to make care more affordable, ensure it's incorporated into primary care, and that it's covered by insurance. We need culturally competent healthcare workers and diversity among providers. We need to reduce stigma, promote early intervention, normalize mental health conversations early, and educate our youth, teachers, and parents. Those of us who know suicide and mental illness are preventable are watching the leaders of this country and waiting for you to do something. And the ones who think suicide and suffering is inevitable, they need you. Vulnerability is contagious and powerful. So I'm here in the hopes that my story might inspire change, both for all of us to work towards healthier communities, but also to inspire other young people who may be listening. If you are suffering, I urge you to speak up. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of our witnesses, but Ms. Renier, thank you so much for your very compelling personal story, your courage, and you are making a difference. We all appreciate it. Um, with that, we are going to begin a, a round of five-minute questions. I again ask my colleagues to keep track of the clock and stay within those five minutes. And I will begin with Dr. Princeton. Um, and you know, as, as we all know, the last two years have been incredibly difficult in, in so many ways, but especially on children and in youth. They, they've faced huge disruptions in their own lives. They've lost loved ones, including their parents. They've missed out on invaluable time with their friends and teachers, and, and it's become so dire that some of our leading experts have declared a, quote, national emergency when it comes to child and adolescent mental health. You know, as a mother myself, a grandmother, and as a former preschool teacher, I, I'm really worried about our kids right now. And we just heard a very compelling story from, from one of them. Uh, I know parents from my home state of Washington all the way to here to the Capitol are, are really concerned about this. And it, I think it's really important to address the effects of trauma, substance use, grief, and other stressors on our kids. And I wanted to ask you today to talk with us about the best practices for identifying trauma and other stressors among our children. Thank you. We have a number of assessment tools that we can use to screen kids and to understand what their experiences may be or even before they experience a crisis. We need the support to be able to launch those tools and also to do research to examine how we can use technology to really make the most use of the kinds of passive screening or opportunities to intervene and offer mental health tips, anything that we can do. In particular, this is really important when we think about underserved and underrepresented youth. It is absolutely critical that we are discussing mental health in schools, that we are building into our curriculum social emotional competence. We have the tools to build kids' resilience. We just need the opportunity to be able to teach what we know to all of those teachers and counselors and administrators so we can help them to identify kids before they reach a moment of trauma. Thank you. Um, Dr. Derman, Dr. Goldsby, I want to talk about inequality within our healthcare system. Uh, it's really led to disparities in our healthcare access and outcomes and resources, and behavioral health is obviously no exception. When trying to get care, people of color often face systemic barriers and are less likely to complete, complete treatment or even get appropriate services. Individuals with disabilities are five times more likely to have mental health needs 
often can't find providers to get the care they need. Meanwhile, in our rural communities, we face significant provider shortages and members of the LGBT community are more likely to experience mental health and substance use disorders. So as this committee now considers legislation to improve mental health and substance use disorder outcomes, we have to do everything we can to address those disparities. So uh, uh, Dr. Jerm, I wanted to start with you. Your work is at a safety net hospital and you see parents experiencing patients experiencing mental health and substance use crisis. What barriers to care do your patients experience and how do they impact behavioral health outcomes and access? Um, thank you, Senator Murray, for that question. Um, you described a lot of um, things in your opening statement that are inequitable in substance use and mental health treatment in general. I think largely what many of us um, as witnesses have said during our testimony so far is that there's a, a huge inequity in just the workforce issue. Um, having mental health providers that maybe don't wanna work with people with substance use issues, having folks with that focus on substance use issues that don't wanna work with um, the mental health aspect of the patient. And so I think that adds a complexity when people wanna go for care, that they have to go to many different providers to get the treatment that they need. Um, we, we need to stop siloing in, in healthcare in general and in mental health care this this distinction that our physical health um, is separated from our mental health. Um, so we see often that people get lost because they go from one provider to another trying to get the treatment they need and deserve, um, and they can't, they can't find one provider to do all of those things. The second thing I'll say is that just in general, getting access to care is very hard for our, for our patients. Um, there are a lot of barriers when we start thinking about what substance use pr treatment programs only want to give medication versus thinking about other psychotherapeutic interventions. How people get into treatment is very difficult. Sometimes, um, unfortunately, providers will say, well, you need to go to the emergency room intoxicated to get a detox bed. Um, if not, they're not going to accept you. This is the reality of how patients get treatment in the system. Um, because of bed availability, because of the way reimbursement happens, because of the way insurers operate. And last but not least, um, I, you know, I do want to think about how do we think about substance use in general, the inequity in that. I think it's probably the only disorder that we consider a crime. You can get stopped, you can get pulled over for, for simply using or possessing this, and we don't treat it like other mental health or physical health issues. Um, I do believe it is a brain illness, it's a chronic, it's relapsing and remitting, and it deserves the full treatment like anybody with diabetes, hypertension, or any other condition. Thank you, and, and I am out of time. So Ms. Goldsby, I'm gonna come back to you on, uh, if I can, later on to ask you that question, and I'll turn it over to Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Claire, thank you. Thank you for your, your testimony, very, very compelling, and thank you for for your voice, your leadership in this very important area. I recall a, a visit that I made out to uh, rural Alaska some years ago. It was a town hall meeting with native leaders and uh, young people from a neighboring village had come to, to the town hall and uh, asked to be recognized. And they raised the issue of suicide. None of the adults in the room wanted to talk about it. The young people, one, one young man said, suicide is becoming normal within our village as far as the youth were concerned, which was shocking and troubling. But it was almost as if there was a generational disconnect. The kids wanted to speak about it, needed to speak about it, and the elders in the room were afraid. They were afraid, I believe, that if they spoke about it, it might be encouraged. You, you have been involved in suicide prevention trainings in school, peer-to-peer. -peer. Share with me a little bit, if you will, and the committee, um, the, not only the importance of increasing access to these trainings, and the recommendations for how we can reach out to kids. Because again, it is younger, it seems that younger and younger uh, children are, are, are feeling these sense of, of depression and despair and crisis and suicidal ideation. It's important how we speak to one another so that it is heard. 
can you, can you address how we can provide for more in the curriculum that's actually meaningful to kids, how we can provide for counselors who understand how to speak the language, because I, I fear that there's a disconnect there. Absolutely, thank you. Um, yeah, suicide is a, a huge issue in Alaska. And actually, one thing, um, Alaska does the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, survey and they show that the percentage of students attempting suicide has grown significantly in the past few years. So in 2019, 25% of all students um, in Alaska school district seriously considered suicide and 20% of them attempted. 20% of them attempted. And so that's one fifth of my classmates. But like how many parents do you think knew about it? Do you think one fifth of parents really knew that their students had seriously you know, attempted suicide? Um, so one thing that prevents students from talking about it is honestly the, the stigma that parents have. So they never even reach the point of asking out or asking for help because they doubt and diminish their experience. They don't believe anything is wrong. They're scared. They think their family will crack jokes or not take them seriously, or they expect their parents to blame themselves. They're afraid they'll be seen as weak or crazy or attention seeking, wacko, broken, a lost cause, any of those things. So. Reducing stigma in general, one of those things that we can do, like in Alaska, what we're trying to do is pass a bill um, that would help bring mental health education into K through 12 schools. So by talking about mental health in schools, specifically in health classes, we begin conversations early and allow space for people to share. So health classes currently cover topics like nutrition and physical health, exercise, dental health, all these sorts of things, cancer prevention, um, and since mental health deserves to be a topic in one of those classes. It's just as important. Um, and guidelines for this kind of curriculum would be developed with local and statewide and national agencies to make sure it was safe and age appropriate. Um, and of course, we wouldn't be teaching the same thing to high schoolers as elementary school kids, but it would help you, you know, see symptoms and recognize them and know what to do about them and reach out for help. So that's one really important thing. Um, also in terms of suicide prevention, just like clubs, like you are not alone club that does suicide prevention trainings in schools and goes around to classes and talks about it. That's a really important thing too. So all of those things working together. Thank you, Claire. Madam Chairman, my, I'm almost out of time, but I think every one of the witnesses in one way or another has talked about the need for, for workforce and whether it is school counselors, those that can work with, with, with kids in programs or whether it is uh, all the way to the other end with a, with a full uh, psychiatric care that is available. And my hope is, is that we build out um, a, a package of focus on, on mental health. We really key in on the workforce issues because I think we recognize that in all our states, we are sorely, sorely lacking. Thank you very much. I look forward to working with you on that. Uh, Senator Casey. Chair Murray, thank you for the hearing, and I want to thank you and Senator Murkowski and Ranking Member Burr, and of course our witnesses. I want to start with um, Director Goldsby uh, with a question regarding plans of safe care. This is an issue I've worked on for years to support uh, both infants and families affected by substance use disorder. We know that uh, infants and their parents need uh, what I think most would refer to as non-punitive uh, services, uh, as well as treatment and, and support as parents navigate uh, both recovery and, and parenting a young child. But despite longstanding federal law, plans of safe care remain very much underutilized. I appreciate the work of this committee in the uh, CAPTA legislation and authorization over time to address some of the issues that have contributed to these plans of safe care being underutilized. Too many families are slipping through the cracks. And so in particular, I appreciate the, the effort to establish a reporting mechanism when an infant needs a plan of safe care that is separate from the uh, child welfare system. But Director Goldsby, I'd, I'd ask you, what steps can, can we take in Congress, <clears throat> especially here in the Senate, to help states and communities adopt public health-driven approaches to substance use uh, 
in both uh, pregnancy and as well as to reach more families in need of support. Senator Casey, I'm, I'm glad you asked. You know, I think thanks to the work of this committee and the CAPTA uh, work that we have underway, we are currently engaged in some in-depth technical assistance with my agency and our South Carolina Social Services Agency as we work hand in hand to develop a plan to address your exact concern. And our plan of safe care work group is focusing on moving intervention services upstream, a more public health uh, approach to support all pregnant individuals who might or may or may not have a substance use issue. But the screening earlier, having that universal screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment for everyone earlier in pregnancy and often in pregnancy really minimizes additional prenatal substance exposure. We've decided to call our plan of safe care a family wellness support plan um, because our aim will really be to initiate that prenatal plan sooner and as soon as the mother is identified either with toxicology or the screening so that we're offering a non-punitive supportive set of services across our systems to include mental health and substance use treatment and all the wraparound services. So for some who have severe substance use diagnosis, this plan might include a referral to one of our family care centers, which is our residential treatment centers for women and children that is supported by the, the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant, um, so that mothers can really stay engaged in services and supported through the delivery of, of their child. Um, and that way, healthcare providers know that they're engaged, know that they're in treatment, and this is all going to lead to more likely results of family remaining unified at the time of delivery so that the mother and the children can continue on in that residential treatment or be discharged home to community-based services. But a lot of education has to be done among our healthcare community for them to understand that, like we mentioned, substance use disorder is, is not a moral failing, but is a, a healthcare issue, a disease state, and that people with mental health and substance use issues really shouldn't be further stigmatized, but assisted. And I'll just note that all of this work, you know, is supported by our Pregnant and Parenting Women program through SAMHSA, our ESPERT work supported by SAMHSA discretionary grants, and of course, our block grant. Director, thank you for your work, and I appreciate your answer. I wanted to turn to Dr. Princeton. Uh, on page 16 of your testimony, you note that implementation of integrated care where primary care and behavioral health care providers work as a team remains unfortunately limited. While there are a lot of models that uh, integrate physical and mental health care, many physicians still don't have the ability to seamlessly connect patients to, to a mental health provider. You, you mentioned some of the, the barriers, whether it's physical space or IT issues or clinical staffing. What should we do uh, in terms of our focus uh, to help more primary care providers move towards integrated care and how can uh, telehealth support the shift? Thank you. Integrated care is, in fact, an excellent way to go. As we just heard before, it's very hard for people to find a health care provider and a mental health care provider. And due to stigma, sometimes even pursuing that in person is difficult. But walking into your physician's office is not attached to stigma. Three things to remember with integrated care. One, it's a lot more than just sticking a mental health care provider into the office of a physician. This is really about the time and the funding that's required for cross-training. So that way physicians and mental health care providers can speak different each other's language, shared records, shared billing processes, these are usually not the traditional one-hour sessions with a mental health care provider. So new billing processes are needed. Two, substantial infrastructure costs are required to successfully integrate be, uh, integrated behavioral care uh, to implement that. So it is uh, important to incentivize physicians to do so. And finally, a one-size-fits-all approach is just not going to work with integrated behavioral care. We have evidence that all approaches can be very effective, and primary care providers need to be the folks to decide how best to set it up in a way that meets their needs, their patients, and their community. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Chair Murray. Thank you. Senator Collins. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Dr. Princeton, I want to discuss with you the impact that the prolonged COVID pandemic has had on our children's mental health. I was struck by two recent columns in the New York Times written by David Leonhardt. 
in which he makes the point very well. He writes, the pandemic's disruptions have led to lost learning, social isolation, and widespread mental health problems for children. Many American children are in crisis, and here's the important point, as a result of pandemic restrictions rather than the virus itself. We know, as Senator Murray has mentioned, that three medical groups representing pediatrics, child psychiatrists, and children's hospitals have recently declared a national emergency in child and adolescent mental health. And the New York Times uh, columnist has concluded that remote schooling has failed and that there's little evidence that shutting schools leads to fewer COVID cases among children. Given that the pandemic has persisted for two years, which is a good portion of many children's lives, what should we be doing as policymakers to balance pandemic response policies with the serious concerns that many parents have expressed to me about their children's, the impact on their children's mental health, the social isolation, the remote learning, the restricted activities that they are seeing directly are harming their children's social and mental development. Thank you for raising that, Senator Collins. The APA joined with AHA and AAP in declaring that national emergency, and we agree. The science is telling us that kids are experiencing mental health difficulties for a whole host of reasons. One is, of course, the major stressor that has occurred in their lives. They're watching relatives that are passing away or being so ill that they need to go to the hospital. They have tremendous disruption in their roles and routines. They see polarization in leaders. Uh, with disagreements between parents and school teachers on what it is they're supposed to do. And they're having a very difficult time also with social isolation, but not necessarily because of the isolation per se, but because of the time that kids are spending on social media instead, which we now know has incredibly dangerous effects not only on kids' development, but on the development of kids' brains during that time. This is a very big issue and very concerning. It also is an opportunity. This is a time when we have people talking about mental health like they have never talked about before. And people are recognizing the need for us to be addressing mental health before it reaches the acute crisis, <clears throat> excuse me, of people needing to go and get outpatient or inpatient treatment. This is an opportunity for us to really build in to the fabric of how we educate, how we talk within our communities, the importance of mental health and resilience programs. Our entire mental health system right now is built for adults. It's built also for people who are already at the point in a crisis and need treatment. That is not what the science suggests. What we could be doing now and what this presents us with an opportunity to do is to pay attention to all of those folks who are at risk or who have not even shown any psychological symptoms yet and build the resilience necessary to ensure that they will never need outpatient or inpatient treatment. That is what we're seeing with kids right now. There is a wide openness to talking about these issues. And kids, uh, just as Ms. Rainier was talking about so eloquently, want us to step up and teach them information about mental health so they can learn the skills before they reach a crisis point. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goldsby, my time has almost expired. But an estimated 636 people in Maine died from drug overdoses last year. That is a terrible and alarming record high. But what it obscures is the actual number of overdoses, which was in the neighborhood of 8,000 overdoses in the state of Maine, where thanks to the heroic efforts of first responders, medical professionals, and sometimes bystanders, they were saved. How can we ensure that non-fatal overdose patients are not just a statistic, but receive the care that they need to prevent 
a subsequent and potentially fatal overdose. Senator Collins, we, you know, talk about overdose reversal in South Carolina as an intervention. And it's in that moment when somebody has faced, you know, a life-threatening situation that they may, you know, be best reached by someone who offers them hope, hope to live, hope to a path to recovery. And I think those intervention services are key as we do more outreach, as we have our first responders saving lives, um, taking advantage of this critical crisis moment to engage people in services that will lead them on a path to long-term recovery. And so that can look a number of ways with a number of different programmings, but I think it's taking advantage of that moment, that life-saving moment that we really engage uh, in, in treatment services. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in uh, 2019, I introduced the Bipartisan National Suicide Hotline Designation Act, which was signed into law uh, in 2020. Converting from the existing 10-digit number to 988 will make it easier for uh, uh, Americans to get the help they need. And I'm uh, proud of the investments included in the American Rescue Plan to support this transition. Um, Dr. Lachman, as you know, the 988 dialing code will be available nationally for calls, texts, or chat uh, beginning in July 2022. What else should we be doing in Congress uh, right now to make sure that the lifeline is equipped to facilitate real access to care? And how can we make sure that uh, the lifeline reaches those uh, in greatest need, um, including our LGBTQ youth. Thank you so much for that question, and thank you for your support. Um, as you know, it, the advent of 988 opens up a whole new opportunity for people to have ready access to mental health care providers and paraprofessionals in ways that they haven't before. Um, there's a couple of things that I think of in terms of what we can do to make sure that we are prepared for this transition. Um, the first one is, is to make sure that everyone has access on the crisis call line to the very best in training. We know that the science advances so fast and there needs to be continued training and retraining to make sure we're using the very best practices to take care of people. For example, we rarely use language such as committed suicide anymore because it denotes that it's a crime. Instead, we say died by suicide, and that's important for someone to know. We also talk about things such as um, it's important to not die, not just for the sake of not dying, but for the sake of having time to transition to recovering the life that you really want to live. So one thing is making sure that there's continued investment and support and making sure that every single person, whether you're the person that they call or that they text is ready and equipped to provide evidence-based practices, interventions, and the language around suicide safer care. The other thing that I think about in terms of making sure that everyone is equipped to reach a care provider who cares about them, including our LGBTQ community, is making sure that we are using inclusive language and the messaging around 988 and making sure that everyone knows that they have a safe place to go when they're talking about suicide. We've seen in our own SAMHSA grant programs, including serving this community, that talking about connectedness, talking about mental health wellness, talking about meaningful living, and as others have testified, moving the language more upstream to where everyone has a place to grow and become their very best self. This language is likely as important as talking about reducing suicide. And so thank you for your attention to this very important transition. The third thing I will say is that we need to make sure that we're building out the entire crisis continuum. Um, 988, as we know, is the starting place, but there also are plans to go into making sure that our mobile crisis um, services are well-equipped and well-trained, and also making sure that we are standing up other crisis infrastructure. For example, um, there's over 600 CSUs, or crisis stabilization units, operating in the United States right now. That provides a really important and critical part of the crisis continuum to make sure that there is diversion from emergency departments. Um, the emergency departments are wonderful in terms of being able to, when people are well-trained, to address and prevent suicide. 
But CSUs uh, have a different model. They have a living room model to where you're coming in and treated from a standpoint of recovery from the beginning, um, and also treated with peer support with a focus on growing and wellness and recovering from suicide or substance abuse or other host of other concerns. So I thank you for your support in making sure that we are building out the entire continuum to make sure that someone reaches someone well-trained who can respond to their immediate need, but also can put them on the path to long-term growth, wellness, and well-being. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Princeton, it sounds like you would like to also reply. Please do. Thank you. I've spent the last 22 years doing research on suicidal youth, those who are at most risk. And thank you so much for the work you've done to establish 988. It is incredibly important that when folks call, of course, they're getting treatment that's likely to work. We now only have science to support one approach to treatment, and the vast majority of folks are not trained in that approach. It's very, very important that we increase the training of providers. In addition, it's important that we have culturally competent providers so folks are able to call and understand the embeddedness of suicidal thoughts within their communities. When I've done that research, we found that suicidal participants would call 10, 12 outpatient providers and not be able to find anyone who would take their case. We need more people trained in suicide. We need more people trained to deal with the scientifically evidence-based approaches to suicide in particular. Happy to help in any way that we can. Thank you. Uh, Senator Casti. Thank you all. Dr. Durham, great to see you. Great uh, to see you as well. For my colleagues, Dr. Durham is a former student, and uh, despite my training, her has done very well. <laughs> and is the only one in the room who recognizes that I'm wearing a Mardi Gras tie. Uh, <laughs> I've been trained in New Orleans. Everybody else thinks I can't match colors. Um, Dr. Durham, you mentioned you opened a 56-bed facility. Now, I understand that Massachusetts has a waiver from the IMD exclusions. Um, and, and, you know, IMD, which says that you can only have 16 beds in your facility. And the issue here is both um, uh, cost, but the perception of going back to the bad old days when we just put people in a big warehouse of the mentally ill and not let them out. But you mentioned as a positive that you're going beyond the 16 beds to 56 beds. Can you speak to the importance of that waiver or that ability to go above 16? Because I assume these are Medicaid patients. Yeah, many of them will be, um, thank you, Senator Cassidy. Again, good to see you as well. Uh, many of them are Medicaid, Medicare, and we do see a very small number of privately insured folks at BMC. Um, but the BMC is a large safety net hospital for the city of Boston and beyond Boston, and we have never had our own inpatient psychiatric unit. So that has caused increased boarding in our own psychiatric emergency room and our emergency room period um, for decades. Um, so a big investment of the hospital is like, where do we send our patients who are on Medicaid or Medicare? Because many of the facilities in and around Boston are also full and at capacity. Um, and so it was an investment for our patients, essentially. So, so just to be sure, uh, unlike the kind of uh, stereotype and the criticism that if you go beyond 16 beds, you're just warehousing, here you find that you're able to provide needed services that otherwise would not be available, correct? I'm not familiar with what you're talking about exactly, but what I can say is that we do need a continuum of care for, for mental health. Sounds great. So we need investment in community, in, in intermediate resources, and an in inpatient level of care, so across the continuum. And over 16 beds allows you to get an economy of scale as well as to provide more services. I'll, I'll add that editorial because that's something for we policymakers to consider, just to say that. Uh, Dr. Lockman, um, in your full testimony, you mentioned the telemental health bill that we're trying to push out. Um, and... and um, can you kind of comment upon the ability of allowing telemental health to address the person power shortage of providers that was previously re re uh, referred to? Absolutely. Um, so when the pandemic hit at Centerstone, we had never used telemental health widely, and we couldn't actually find research to understand the degree to which it would be effective, particularly in our population. Our population has a lot of community-based needs, a lot of psychosocial barriers, and there was a great need to be able to reach them quickly. Um, we have done our own research in terms of, and actually in part through the SAMHSA grant, so we're so thankful for that federal funding. And we have seen that providing services via phone or telehealth has about the same outcomes as being seen face-to-face. -face. This has allowed us incredible mobility during the time of the pandemic. It's allowed our providers to see more patients 
Um, and it's also allowed more people to come and have better access to care. Um, that really transverses a lot of psychosocial barriers. So, so I'm running out of time. Sir. To cut to the chase, you would highly recommend that Congress pass my bill. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> we highly support telehealth services and um, phone-based services for mental health provision. Sounds great. <laughs> Dr. Princeton, you uh, highlight the importance of programs such as the programs for children with a serious emotional disturbance, which Senator Murphy and I uh, were able to get passed as part of a bigger piece of legislation, and the Community Mental Health Block Grant targeting funds at children with serious emotional disturbances. Now, we've heard from states that because it is perceived in the regs that the child has to have a diagnosis of serious emotional disturbance before they would qualify to benefit from these funds, that we should make it clear that the funds could be used for preventive services to prevent a child from developing SED, if you will. Any comment on that? Yes, first of all, thumbs up on the Telemental Health Improvement Act. Excellent, science supports that that is working. So, uh, second, yes, there's a huge backlog right now for folks who are waiting to get an individualized education plan from a school psychologist, sometimes waiting years until they can get that diagnosis so they can access those funds. So I agree that having the ability to access those funds for preventive services would be fantastic. Okay, I'm almost out, uh, Ms. Rainier. Thank you so much for what you do. Um, as someone who's Families being affected by suicide by a young person. I'm sorry to be emotional. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you to um, this tremendous panel. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for convening this hearing. Thank you, Senator Cassidy, for your heroic work um, standing up for people with um, mental illness and learning disabilities. And if I can just for a moment, lift up um, a piece of legislation that Senator Cassidy and I worked on and this committee supported. Um, we passed legislation through this committee making real the mental health parity legislation that Congress passed decades ago. The reality was we told plans to cover mental health just like you cover health for the rest of the body, but it didn't work out that way. Plans ended up putting uh, up all sorts of barriers and bureaucracy and red tape in front of getting reimbursement for mental health that they didn't for an orthopedic procedure or uh, an operation on your heart or lungs. Um, one of the things we did a few years ago is require the Department of Labor and Department of Health and Human Services to do an audit of a select group of insurance plans. Um, and we just got the report. Um, it's both defeating and encouraging, it basically came to the conclusion that not a single insurance plan that they reviewed was in full compliance with parity. But through these audits, they actually got the plans to change their practices and parameters such that now tens of thousands of mental health consumers are now actually getting what they paid for when they paid their insurance premiums. Um, you know, an example is, you know, one insurance plan was covering nutritional therapy for diabetes, but was not covering it for anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating. Another example was a plan was requiring prior authorization for all outpatient procedures um, for mental health and substance abuse, but was not requiring it for a broad range of orthopedic procedures. Um, so we're finally getting this right. And um, I wanted to maybe pose this question to you, Dr. Durham, to talk a little bit about your experience in dealing with insurance companies and families who are trying to get reimbursement and the differences that you see in a big medical system in the way that barriers are put up when it comes to mental health and substance abuse that just don't exist when you're going to get the follow-up treatment on an operation on your knee. Um, I think we're making progress here thanks to this committee, but I, I think we still have a long way to go. Um, thank you, Senator Murray, for your question. Um, I agree completely that none of this is new to us that are on the front lines, that are serving patients day in and day out. Um, that I have not read the port in fully, but I understand that, um, and all in all, that insurers are not allowing us to treat people with the best evidence um, at all times, um, whether that's medication, whether that's therapy, whether that's trying to get them into another facility for more intense care. And so what happens in our emergency room, for an example, is that 
we do have to get what we call a prior auth, prior to sending someone to an inpatient psychiatric facility. Um, you would never do that with someone who comes in with a heart attack to the emergency room. They immediately go and get the help they need on the medical floor um, and no questions asked. Um, and so we spend hours sometimes, our, our social work colleagues, ourselves, our case managers in the emergency room, just trying to get someone placed. And at times, they're to the level of where someone like me as a physician has to do, do a doc to doc um, to essentially say our case. Why do we want this patient to go into an inpatient psychiatric unit? And there are times where we're denied and we have to figure out another level of care. In the outpatient world as well, I'm a child psychiatrist and I see kids in the clinic, and I have been on the phone with an insurer as well when a medication adjustment needs to be made um, for hours. So my time in the clinical setting where I should be seeing patients um, is spent on the phone trying to essentially get a kid that was always on a medicine, but the formulary changed and I wanted them to continue that medicine. Um, we need a lot of help in this area. Um, we need to have parity for physical and mental health and not have to be at the, the beck and call, if you will, of these prior auths. Um, very well said, and this is an issue I know that there'll be bipartisan agreement on because we're just asking for compliance to the existing law. We don't have to pass a new requirement on insurers. We just have to give the tools to the departments to make sure that the insurers comply. Um, I'm going to submit a, a question for the record to um, the panel with respect to um, how we get um, more professionals who are in contact with kids, um, a little bit of extra learning on mental health first aid and mental health diagnosis. You know, we spend billions of dollars on training for teachers and uh, for pediatricians, um, and, and we could do better by giving a little bit additional help on um, identifying um, some of the root causes. And, and lastly, let me just say thank you to uh, you, Ms. Rainier. Um, thank you for speaking truth to power on this issue and for standing up for kids. I'm a parent to a teenager and a preteen, and so I see um, the rabbit hole that kids can go down when they are experiencing those first signs of crisis, given um, how online some pretty toxic um, information and influences are, and I think you've opened our eyes to that with your testimony today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Braun. Thank you, Madam Chair. In March of 2021, American Rescue Plan was signed into law $4 billion to address the opioid uh, epidemic. But with that, and the lack of anything substantive in terms of trying to crack down on the source, fentanyl is mostly made in China, trafficked through Mexico. Listen to these statistics. I want the public to hear it uh, mostly. 100,000 Americans have died in the last year due to overdoses. Many of them, if not most of them, from fentanyl. This is the part that is most shocking. In the age group, 18 to 45, we've lost more young people from overdoses than COVID, car accidents, and suicides. So it's another example of where spending money was not a solution without real teeth, real substantive uh, directives at the source of it. We visited the southern border a little less than a year ago, and we were going from record low illegal crossings to about 70 to 75,000. That's now leveled out at about 170,000. I mean, appalling. I've got two questions, both for Ms. Goldsby. When it comes to not only the impact on losing lives, but along with workforce to boot, I think we've lost close to 2 million prime age workers due to the fact that they're uh, contending with opioid issues. How much of this issue is directly related to the policies we have on our southern border, where illegal crossings are up, the fentanyl comes along with it. Uh, how much has that contributed to this tragic loss of life? Senator Braun, thank you for your question. Um, you know, a couple of things. My expertise rests with prevention, treatment, and recovery service delivery, but 
you know, from 2018 to 2019 in South Carolina, we were really making headway and saw the number of overdoses leveling off due to all of our efforts and all of the federal funding with state targeted and state opioid response funds. Um, since then, and in the last two years, uh, our overdoses have skyrocketed and we're estimating about 63% of our overdose fatalities in 2020 were a direct result of the extremely potent illicit fentanyl in the drug supply. I think in the last two years, we have pivoted to doing everything we can to keeping people alive and implementing evidence-based harm reduction and intervention services. Uh, we've got naloxone everywhere that we can get it, um, the life-saving antidote. Uh, with the flexibilities and the funding support from SAMHSA, we've been able to distribute fentanyl test strips to those individuals who may not know what substances they're ingesting as the illicit uh, fentanyl has get in, gotten into the methamphetamine supply and the cocaine supply. Um, you know, and the evidence suggests that people are better able to prevent an unintended overdose death if they use these fentanyl test strips. They are using less of the drug and every interaction to get these supplies to people on the streets where they are uh, is an opportunity to engage them in treatment services and get them on the path to recovery. And so that's where our efforts are focusing so heavily now. And, and I'll say um, we're not feeling defeated, but it's been a major setback in the last couple of years with how dramatically things have shifted. Well, thank you. I think without directly saying so by deduction, you can relate what's happening on the southern border to what you're grappling with. Uh, Senator Markey and I uh, have got two pieces of legislation about increasing provider and patient education. Uh, one is the label Opioids Act, and the other, the Safe Prescribing of Controlled Substances Act. Uh, through your work in addressing the opioid epidemic, can you speak to the importance of provider and patient education and how these bills might impact that? Ms. Goldsby. Senator Braun, thank you, sorry. Um, I, I think the patient and provider education is key, um, and we have a long way to go, especially with our provider education and all of our healthcare workforce. I think it's been a theme today that we've talked about, you know, uh, folks not understanding addiction and mental health issues as disorders, um, addiction issues as chronic diseases, and the evidence-based uh, services, interventions, and treatment models that address these disorders successfully. And so we've come a long way. Um, we've invested a lot in our response and, and engaging the workforce as such, but I know that we have a long way to go, especially as we contemplate access and what that means for people who are approaching healthcare providers who, who don't or, or don't know how or don't address addiction appropriately. Thank you. I'd like you and the other members of the panel to take a look at these two bills. It'd be a small step in at least trying to get more information out there and to weigh in on uh, maybe endorsing uh, both of these pieces of legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Kane. Thank you, Chair Murray. What an excellent panel of witnesses and my colleagues have asked very, very good questions. I, I want to first put a challenge on the table that I may be asking my colleagues to help us resolve. Um, two officers who were here defending the Capitol on January 6th died by suicide in the days right after that attack. Uh, Howard Liebmangood was a Capitol Police officer. Jeffrey Smith was a Metro Police officer. Two other Metro Police officers died by suicide a number of months later. I don't mention them because their families have not reached out and asked for help, and I don't want to presume their intentions. But the, the families of officers Smith and Liebmangood have reached out for help. Law enforcement officers, federal and state, local, are generally accorded a death benefit should they die in the line of duty. But law enforcement officers' uh, death benefits uh, usually state that a death by suicide cannot be a death in the line of duty. Um, that is a significant injustice that is directly tied to antiquated notions of suicide. It's often hard to determine whether a death is in the line of duty. If a, if a law enforcement officer dies of, a, of cancer, usually the administrators of these plans have to go back and determine, well, was the officer exposed to a toxic substance in the line of duty, or is it related to something else? But to declare categorically 
that no death by suicide can ever be a line of duty death is a fundamental injustice. And both the Smith and Liebman Good families are now taking that up with the respective benefit plans under which they served. Um, in the military, military suicides are not excluded as line of duty deaths. In fact, an overwhelming percentage of death by suicide of active duty military, um, they get investigated and the in the overwhelming percentage of these cases, they're determined to be a line of duty deaths. So this is a really important mental health issue for law enforcement. There's an unjust and antiquated view of suicide affecting these line of duty death determinations. There are two who served at this Capitol and died by suicide in the days right after the January 6th attack. And um, they have ongoing proceedings going before the relevant authorities, and so it may be slightly premature, but we may need to address this as a matter of law in the same way that we've allowed active duty military to have a suicide determined to be in the line of duty. Law enforcement officers should not be shut off from that. Um, I want to ask each of you about a passion of mine that has been shared by members of the committee, and that is the mental health of our healers, keeping our healers healthy. Um, mental, uh, medical professionals prior to the pandemic had very dramatically escalated rates of suicide compared to the general population. Um, and many medical professionals feel some significant stigma about seeking mental health counseling because of worrying about its effect on credentialing at hospitals or licensing at the state level or what colleagues might think. Committee colleagues have joined together with me in a bipartisan way to, to pass the Lorna Breen Act, which I introduced with others on this committee, uh, named uh, to commemorate a very talented emergency room physician in New York, a Virginia native who died by suicide at the beginning of the real wave of pandemic in April of 2020. But what can we do in the profession to uh, help our healers feel more able to get the help they need? Sure. Um, thank you, Senator Kane, for bringing that up. And thank you for your work in this area. It is, in fact, very important. We are definitely seeing burnout. <clears throat> the mental health care providers are frontline workers, too, of course. And we're seeing major burnout and concern among mental health care providers. In partnership with the CDC, the American Psychological Association has been providing some services for healthcare providers who are not only experiencing burnout and need psychological first aid training, but also are quite angry and are feeling really challenged by the amount of harassment that they're uh, getting, the amount of victimization that they're being subjected to for treating folks due to COVID, for offering vaccines and a remarkable amount of frustration that they're experiencing for their patients that they can't get the opportunity to treat because uh, they're overrun with folks who are experiencing COVID and are unvaccinated. There are a variety of things that can be done. Um, as you ask, uh, providing concrete support, modeling self-care, psychological first aid training, as I mentioned. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I wanted to um, thank you for both of your points, really raising this issue of stigma that is still pervading the way that we think about mental health issues versus physical health issues. And I hope that this committee um, can be very, very clear that that's uh, sometimes also even reflected in the amount of funding that we provide to develop a workforce in mental health versus physical health care. And that just has to stop. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you, Chair Murray. Thank, thank you, Senator Marshall. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to lock in on prior authorization for a second. And my first question is for Dr. Durham. Prior authorization is the number one administrative burden facing physicians today across all specialties. Prior authorization, the number one administrative burden facing all physicians across all specialties. As a physician myself, I knew of the frustration uh, of having to do this, talk to a, a person who may be a non-specialist who wasn't from my area. So I couldn't imagine trying to do a prior auth with you uh, on a patient in the ER, your years of experience. And, and as an obstetrician, I'm trying to tell you who doesn't have need inpatient management. Couldn't imagine doing that. But this burnout's leading to early retirement. It ties up nurses. It's frustrating to nurses as well. It makes us all less productive. I guess my, and you spoke about this earlier, prior authorization. My question is, do you ever feel that prior authorization is used to ration care or to delay the care the patient needs? 
Um, thank you so much for your question. And um, as a fellow physician, um, that you understand sort of what we're going through, um, I do think it delays care. Um, absolutely, especially in the emergency room context. Um, we have literally two to three hours sometimes just to get someone a bed because we're waiting for the insurance to respond to give the okay that yes, um, what you have presented to us meets the criteria um, for us to get a patient an inpatient psychiatric bed. So without a doubt, it delays care. And when we're thinking about an emergency room, we have a lot of patients we need to see. I, I talked briefly in my testimony about we've been beyond capacity in our emergency rooms, and I think that that's not unique to BMC, but across the nation during this crisis that people are going in for emergency services. And so awaiting beds, awaiting placement, just you know, clogs the system, if you will. Thank you. My next question for Dr. Uh, Prince, Prinstein, and we're gonna stay on the same uh, subject of prior authorization. If there was a streamlined solution, would it be helpful to your specialty? Streamlined meaning, I would suppose that 10 diagnoses account for 80 or 90% of the uh, issues that need to be prior auth. We have Senate Bill 3018, it's bipartisan, uh, by camera as well. We have 17 sponsors, uh, in, including eight Democrats, nine Republicans, 450 national and state organizations are sponsoring this legislation, which would streamline the prior authorization. Would it be helpful for members in your specialty? Yes, I think it would, and thank you. Um, psychiatry represents of course, a small percentage, just 10% of the mental health workforce, the rest of us are psychologists, social workers, counselors, marriage and family therapists, and thinking of solutions that include all mental health providers is appreciated. Thank you. You bet. My next question for Ms. Goldsby, uh, you work in, a, in the Department of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Services. Does prior authorization ever impact your patients, especially does it delay care or ration care? Senator Marshall, we do sometimes see um, prior authorizations delaying care, particularly for some patients who have insurance benefits um, when they're needing to be placed on medications. And a streamlined approach to those patients would be beneficial to, to your staff? Yes, absolutely. No barriers to treatment, yes. Okay. Dr. Lockman, kind of the same issue, prior authorization in your world. I know you're doing research, uh, more research-based. Do you ever sit there and think about uh, some of what your research leads you to that will patients have access to it? Are you worried about an insurance company deciding as opposed to evidence-based medicine deciding what that patient should be receiving? Absolutely, I concur. You know, every single hour that we spend navigating preauthorization to get a patient the evidence-based treatment that he or she needs is an hour that could be spent on something else. You know, delivering the care that changes people's lives. It could be spent on um, also doing the training that you'll have mentioned is critical. So I think any way that we can cut down on the processes um, would be helpful to where we can just give people the treatment that they need. Okay, thank you so much. I'll go to Ms. Rainier. Ms. Rainier, I'm not gonna ask you about prior authorization. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so that's a good thing. I guess my question for you is, uh, have you experienced some of the mandates, whether it's a mask mandate or vaccine mandate, closing down school? How has that impacted the mental health of your uh, co-students? I think there's been some silver linings. And of course, I think COVID has exacerbated and introduced new issues. So during typical high school classes, a teacher is one of the first lines of defense. They can catch, you know, changes in a student's behavior, performance, or attitude. But during Zoom classes, I stared at a screen of gray squares. And so, you know, the teachers found fewer opportunities to, to ask, like, hey, are you okay? How are things going at home? You seem a little off. Is there anything you want to talk to or talk about? So that's kind of a, one bad thing. But a silver lining, on the other hand, is, like, I think the conversation around mental health has become a little bit more comfortable. And so teachers have been like, if you need a self-care day, take the day off, go take a walk, go to do your own thing. You know, let's take the Zoom class off for today. And that was something that was totally okay to do. So I think mm, there's good and bad. I think I'm willing to stay at home for the safety of our community. I also know that for some families that makes it really hard. And for some families, it's not safe for the student to stay at home. And school is kind of like this safety net, this security blanket to be away from that. Um, and so that makes it tough. I don't know if there's a way to say that it was all bad or all good. Okay. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. Senator Hassan. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank you and the ranking member for organizing and uh, approving today's hearing. And to all of the witnesses, thank you so much for being here and for the work that you do. I want to start with a question uh, to you, Dr. Princeton. Young patients are being forced to wait in emergency rooms for up to a month, hoping an inpatient psychiatric bed will open up. And sometimes in my state, it's more than that. They have written to me recounting their experiences waiting in hospitals. They describe truly horrific experiences, such as being kept in isolation and going weeks without showers, let alone mental health care. The situation is so severe that New Hampshire used federal funds to purchase a local hospital to take these children out of the emergency room, but we know there's more work that still needs to be done, and even with the purchase of this hospital and now additional beds, uh, there are still long waits in our emergency rooms. What concrete steps can Congress take to effectively reduce youth wait times for urgent mental health care? Thank you so much for the question, Senator. I appreciate it. It is, it is the case that once someone, and especially a child, is experiencing imminent risk towards themselves and others, they do need to be in a hospital. They do need the constant surveillance. And we might think that adding more hospital beds is the answer. It certainly is an opportunity to make sure we have enough emergency services. But the problem truly has to be addressed by offering more outpatient providers that can make sure that kids never get to that level of crisis. We have the treatments. We have the science to show that it works. We just need more people to administer those treatments and keep kids from getting to that emergency stage. 750 times more funding to make sure we have enough physicians in this country than what we're providing for our entire mental health care workforce. If we had that, if we treated the likelihood that one out of every five young women will experience a major depressive episode before the age of 25. As we heard Ms. Rainier say in Alaska, one out of every four young people are going to experience severe suicidality. Think what we would do if that was a physical health disorder. We would be training people to what to expect. We'd be training parents and teachers to spot the warning signs. We would be making sure that everyone had access to treatment the minute that they started showing any symptoms of a physical health illness whatsoever. Right. But it's happening for depression. And the reason why we're seeing all of this overrun in the hospitals is because we haven't provided the workforce to make sure that we can provide outpatient treatment before we reach that crisis stage. Well, thank you. And let me follow up on the points you're making with Ms. Rainier and Dr. Durham. Um, it's important that we acknowledge the stigma around mental health in schools. And Ms. Rainier, you were just talking a little bit about uh, things opening up a little bit and people talking more about it. I received a letter from a student from Candia, New Hampshire, sharing her experience with what she considers a, is a real lack of awareness in her school. She wrote in part, Schools and workplaces are not taking mental health seriously. We do not learn about mental health in school nor the workplace. I've seen firsthand the way that these disorders can affect people. It's not seriously talked about, not taken seriously enough. It's powerful to hear students like this young woman talk openly about mental health, and we need to do more to support them, points you all have been making. So Dr. Durham and Ms. Rainier, how can we work with students to end the stigma around mental health? And I'll start with Dr. Durham, and then we'll go to Ms. Rainier. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, when I think about the patients I see at BMC in particular, I, I talked about under-resourced communities, um, mostly low-income Black and Latinx folks that come and see us. There's a huge stigma in ethnic my, minority communities, um, and we need to start, like many of people have said here, in schools, at home, but also partnering with other community organizations, the church, other systems of care that people go to other than healthcare systems, right. that we can start opening that dialogue and thinking more, more openly, sort of like Claire has done today, telling our stories. Um, and so we have a lot of initiatives, even within Boston Medical Center, of reaching out and partnering with our local churches. We have people in our department that are doing some of that work to start breaking down barriers and stigma so people can come in for treatment. Well, thank you. Ms. Rainier. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I was going to say the same thing. We can support community and local organizations. Um, some of the ones that I was in was I was introduced to Yana, You Are Not Alone Club, Suicide Prevention Trainings, but also MHATS, Mental Health Advocacy Through Storytelling. And that encouraged me to tell my story. So the program is youth-led, it's youth-founded, 
It's a group of Anchorage High School students working to decrease stigma and increase access to mental health resources through true personal short stories of mental health struggle and triumph. And we run a program, a 12 week program twice a year aiming to teach and guide conversations on mental health and storytelling and then help participants develop their own stories on mental health. And then all of our participants share the story they've developed at a final live storytelling event, kind of in the style of the Moth Radio Hour or anything else like that. So helping organizations and promoting them and you know encouraging them and funding them and things like that is really, really important. It was my own friends at this organization who taught curriculum and helped me tell my story. And it's because of those resources and that education that I opened up to my parents last year and the reason why I'm here today. Well, thank you. And I realize I'm out of time. I'll follow up, Ms. Goldsby, with a question to you about telehealth and medication-assisted treatment. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Smith. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, and I'd like to start by asking unanimous consent to submit for the record um, a letter from AFSCME Council 5 and AFSCME Council 65 in Minnesota on the need for sustainable solutions and long-term investments in the mental health care workforce. So ordered. Uh, Chair Murray and um, uh, Senator Murkowski, I'm so grateful for you holding this hearing and bringing together these experts and colleagues to dig into mental health and substance use disorder um, challenges. I mean, this is an epidemic, as we've heard today, that is traumatizing our country. And uh, Dr. Princeton said it so well in his opening remarks that this emergency is related to COVID, um, but it is the result of decades of systemic neglect and lack of attention and bifurcating mental and physical health um, to the detriment of our whole health. Um, and I can tell you, of course, I hear about this from Minnesotans every single day, educators and parents and students especially who are grappling with um, significant mental health conditions. And you know, I wanna share that this is personal for me for two reasons. And the first, is that my mentor, Paul Wellstone, who once held the seat that I have today, led on this issue with Senator New Mexico Senator Pete Domenici. And through their leadership, they Congress passed legislation to get parity for mental and physical health reimbursements in the insurance system. Now, as we've heard today, we are still uh, climbing up that mountain to get compliance for mental health parity. Um, and we won't stop until we do. Um, but I want to just note their leadership, which was instrumental. And the second reason that this issue is personal to me is that I experienced depression when I was a young person, um, starting in college, and then again when I was a young mom. And so I know a little bit about what it feels like to feel like there is something fundamentally wrong with you and there is nothing that can be done about it. There is no solution. Um, and you know, I share my story because I want to I'm thinking about people who are currently suffering from mental health challenges and feel like they're all alone and nobody knows, nobody knows, and that they can't talk about it because of the stigma. So Ms. Rainier, I want to particularly thank you for um, your testimony and for sharing your story. Um, Senator Mikowski knows that I actually also went to East Anchorage High School, so we have a little bit of Anchorage in common as well. Um, but let me go. I'm going to stay with you, um, Ms. Um, Rainier. I want to just talk a little bit about uh, mental health care in schools. Um, last month, the University of Minnesota released some data which said that 71% of principals in Minnesota are saying that more mental health resources for students would be the most important um, support that they could get. Um, and I visited schools and I've seen how this works and what a difference it can make. Um, so Ms. Rainier, could you talk to us about why in-school services are important, why they work for students, and um, kind of how you see they might get at the stigma challenges and other challenges that students have accessing uh, the mental health care that they need. Sure, yeah. So well, school is a great place just because it's a place where all students are going to be, and you can do a lot of different things in schools. You can have the community, you can have the teaching, you can have peers, you can have adults all working together. Um, and your parents too. Um, and also, you know, we have counselors and therapists, or we want to have counselors and therapists in schools. Um, but also, you know, having the curriculum around is really important. Um, you know, I've talked to 
numerous students who say they didn't realize how bad of a situation they were until years later. Like they never recognized their own systems. They never reached out for help. So having curriculum in schools is great to help people recognize their own symptoms and be like, oh, I think something's going on. I need to reach out to somebody. That person that they need to reach out to is, oh, and C-130, this room down the hall that they can walk down there and say like, hey, I really need some help. That counselor can call the parent and be like, hey, I talked to your kid. Maybe you should talk to them. So it's a really great place to have all those services in one place. It's such a great way of describing what difference it makes. And also I would say how we can, you're really integrating physical and mental health because maybe you go in to see the school nurse about a stomach ache and then the school nurse asks some questions and understands that what you really um, need, um, you know, there's some underlying issues you need to address around anxiety or depression. And it happens all in one place in the kind of integrated um, care that um, we've heard um, the um, experts and physicians on the panel talk about. Um, uh, Madam Chair, as you know, I am I'm sure you know that I have several bills that I have been working on that would expand access to mental health care services in schools. Um, and I'm uh, going to be very interested in pursuing these um, bills and this legislation as we go forward for exactly the reasons that um, Claire just described. Thank you so much. Thank you. Senator, Senator Rosen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, and thank you, Senator Murkowski, for holding this really important hearing today and, of course, for the witnesses um, for being here. I want to build on what Senator Smith was talking about because it is important that we equip schools with the comprehensive uh, mental health and suicide prevention resources we know are so critical because not just Senator Smith, but we've heard from everyone this morning, schools, uh, our students, we're just facing such a growing mental health crisis and the American Academy of Pediatrics they recently declared a national state of emergency in children's mental health. And in Nevada's Clark County School District, we've tragically lost 20 students, 20 students to suicide since the onset of the pandemic in 2020. If families will never be the same. And so we must do more to keep our students safe, to promote their mental health and their well being, which is why, as Senator Murkowski noted earlier, I'm working with her on bipartisan legislation to help provide additional resources to support K through 12 mental health. And currently the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration or SAMHSA for short, does not, does not have the authority to provide funding assistance directly to school districts to promote comprehensive um, health and suicide prevention services. So Dr. Princeton, Given the current mental health crisis in our schools, could legislation authorizing SAMHSA to directly provide targeted and timely resources to K through 12 schools help prevent the mental health challenges before they, they occur and of course address um, suicide attempts and, and uh, pre prevent a suicide from taking place? Yes, Senator Rosen, thank you so much. Hooray, this is a great step and very, very important. The opportunity to make sure that schools themselves can use their local expertise and their knowledge of what their community needs is a fantastic idea. I will say, please do keep in mind that school staff are currently overwhelmed and usually turning to psychology um, and as, as well as other mental health care providers to teach them about the skills that are needed. Psychologists mm -hmm. often do this just out of the goodness of their own heart. There's no reimbursement mechanism. So as this starts to become hopefully a far more widespread practice of schools instituting preventive programs throughout entire communities, please do think about ways that psychologists and other mental health care providers can be as helpful and dedicate as much time as possible um, to help teach the school staff what's needed, to use our evidence-based assessments to screen for risk, and to use our evidence-based interventions so we can help as many people as possible. We have many prevention programs ready to deploy, and this is a very exciting um, opportunity that you're speaking of. Thank you. Well, you set me up perfectly for my, uh, for my next mm -hmm. question because all 17 counties in Nevada are designated as health professional shortage areas. And so it's uh, why I'm really proud of the work being done by University of Nevada, Reno, the master's level students, they're providing mental health counseling services to K to K through 12 students in nearby Churchill County, and hopefully doing some of that other training when they're in the schools uh, that you speak of. 
And this partnership allows our UNR interns to gain real world experience in a supervised setting while also increasing the access and just the knowledge base for, for everyone in those schools, particularly right now in Churchill K through 12 students. So again, Dr. Princeton, um, this is a model, we're using it in Nevada. Um, how might this model um, or others that you see, not just in Nevada, uh, how can we lead the way in helping to promote um, promote these kinds of partnerships mm -hmm. that will address the burnout and the critical shortages and give those benefits to the uh, to the students and, and teachers as well, counselors. I, I think it would be terrific if we had the workforce to be able to do that in all states. Imagine that there were school psychologists enough to deploy and consult with every school school out there, not just one per school district or one per county, sometimes with kids waiting for years before they're able to get an evaluation. Meanwhile, their parents watch them failing grades and experiencing difficulties, just waiting for that school psychologist to join in. There is sometimes only one mental health care provider for an entire county or for a hundred mile radius, which makes it very hard to consult with all the school districts that ask us to really play a role in just the way that you're describing. So I think that this approach coupled with a substantial increase in the workforce um, could really be a wonderful model for us to try and change the way that we're thinking about mental health from a prevention approach as well as an intervention approach. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I look forward to uh, working with all, all of you and my colleagues to promote uh, workforce training in the mental health space. Um, we really need it uh, in so many areas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, and we do have two votes called. So that is all the senators who have questions. Senator Murkowski, do you have any closing remarks? Just very quickly, Madam Chairman. And, and again, I agree. This has been an excellent, excellent panel. You know, when we when we think about the issue of the issues of mental health and substance use disorders, so much of the response has to be when the individual is ready for it. It needs to be the the intervention at that moment. And and I was struck. I keep going back to to reading Claire's testimony. And uh, Claire, you you indicate you said, well, I worked at NAMI, the National uh, Association of Mental Ill Illness. I had to tell people they would be on a wait list for nine to 12 months before they'd receive care from a caseworker. Three months before the patient would be even contacted to confirm they could be accepted. Another six months before they could talk to a caseworker and begin care. So when we talk about the workforce issues, we cannot have a situation an emergency, a crisis, and have an individual be told, it'll be three months before we know whether you can even receive care. So a lot of focus on, on the mental health issues. I'll, I'll tell you, um, Dr. Prinstein, when you, when you indicated that the United States is number one in the world for suicide rates, we, we, we think that money can solve a lot of things. Um, but apparently we're not directing the resources to these very critical areas of mental health like we need to. Apparently we haven't dedicated the resources for the workforce. Apparently we haven't connected with the younger people and, and really all across the spectrum. We haven't addressed some of the racial issues that, that you have pointed out here. So we, uh, we obviously have a great, great, great deal to do here. And I think that today's Today's uh, witnesses have provided us great insight, but it's a reminder that we have so much to do. So thank you to all of our witnesses and look forward to, to working on these problems. Senator Murkowski, thank you. And thank you for um, helping us put this together. Thank you to all of our witnesses. Senator Murkowski, you talked about workforce. I, that clearly is an issue. A number of other issues were addressed, but I think you actually identified one at the very beginning, which we don't talk about enough, and that is how do we talk about suicide? And I think there is, as you stated, among young people, a willingness, a desire, understanding that this cannot be a taboo topic, that in fact, um, we need to ha have an understanding of it, we need to have a discussion of it, but it is so hard for so many people to talk about it, as you said, because they fear that they are going to encourage somebody to do it. We all have a lot of learning to do, and we have a lot of learning within our schools and across our communities. Uh, to deal with this issue, and I look forward to working with you, Senator Murkowski, on that and all of our colleagues. Uh, that will end our hearing today. Uh, I again want to thank Senator Murkowski for joining me today. 
for all of our colleagues for a very insightful discussion. And I really want to thank all of our witnesses, Dr. Princeton, Dr. Durham, Director Goldsby, Dr. Lockman, and Ms. Rainier for sharing your time and experience with us. For any senators who wish to ask additional questions, questions for the record will be due in 10 business days, February 15th at 5 p.m. This committee will next meet February 8th for a hearing on employment opportunities and challenges for people with disabilities. Committee stands adjourned.